And I'm an expert on nothing. Oh so God. I'm gonna ride I'm just gonna ride the train with you tonight, David. Or Daniel. David. Jesus. <laughs> I'm rubbing said, off on you. I'm rubbing off on you. You are rubbing off on me, man. I've had too many conversations with you. And you were talking about Dave Coffin right before this. So Daniel. Yeah, surprisingly, as dumb as I look and maybe as dumb as I sound. I actually do think about stuff a lot to where like you think things. about a lot of things very much all, all of the time. Yeah. I don't have a choice. And this is, this is the kind of stuff is the reason why I tell you that. I can know, imagine it's an orb weaver's web of just directional thoughts that your brain is going like a beautiful orb weaver spider of like right. thoughts going on. So <laughs> I got something. This is an older shirt that I have that I'm like, I, I have to do this for you. Don't get mad. <laughs> That's awesome. I know. Right. It's now so I can work at hot topic. <laughs> yeah. I always like have that to fall back on. If, the, if things fall apart, I'm going to hit up hot topic and be that old guy at hot topic. You got to get me in touch with your earring guy because that those are cool earrings, but yet now I need a second job because of all these medical bills. So now I got to go work a hot topic. I I'm my earring guy. I thought you said there was a guy that you had these spider web earrings. I bought, I bought spider web earrings from a gentleman who vended at the oddities expo. Yeah. Hmm. Those were cool because he said they're very rad. He like he like takes the orb weaver web and he won't tell me his secrets, but he takes the orb weaver web and preserves them. And you could buy like a print with the orb weaver web on it, or you could buy like postcards. And he made earrings and necklaces and stuff with the actual spider web in them. These are just my normal gauges. I can stick my finger through, but the the orb weaver spider webs are very cool. Those, those are very cool. I was very. All right, I'm going to keep us on task today. So if we go okay. too far tangentially, I'm going to rein us back in. Well, there's so much we can talk about. Rein us back uh, in. There is something I might, I was thinking about earlier that I was kind of wanting to talk about a little bit. Um, and I don't have usually answers for a lot of the things, but I like engaging in this conversation with you. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I, I love engaging in conversations like these. And I mean, I don't, we don't have a lot of views when it comes down to uh, this stuff. But I enjoy the conversation nonetheless. I do too. Otherwise, I it wouldn't. It be just a conversation between us that we put out in the ether. And if people find it, cool. Yeah. It's out actually, there somewhere. I'm if a tree falls in the woods and no one's there to hear it, does it make a sound? See, that's the thing is I we don't have to change everybody. No. You know, well, you no. Know what we can do? We won't be able to. And see, um, I'm going to share this screen with you. But the um, – God, where the hell is my share screen? Okay. So this is our last video we did. It got 42 views. But I need to break this down. And it <laughs> – it shows 3.5 hours of watch time. This doesn't really mean anything. This is the most important stat right here. And we can see the massive drop off. And this happens every single time. You have this uh, 33%. And this, this should happen every time. Like within the first minute or so, you should have a massive drop off. Uh, a lot of good videos get about uh, 25 to 50% after this, but we can see I'm only getting about five to seven, five, seven, 12, like they're jumping around. That's what this shows you. And so you can tell what topics people are more likely to be interested in this way. This is how you do this. And then you have engagement. So the average view time is 503 it kind of shows you a little bit more where people are coming from, your audience, uh, the reach. So we impressions. So we got reached out to 1,400 people. K. That's what that's basically saying. 1,000, 1. 1.4 thousand people. Yeah. 
And so um, it doesn't really show us. We can see that it's not doing great, but I think once I break everything down, I think it'll actually do better. And because there's so much there that is so cool. And we can see comments like somebody made it through the whole video and was like, this is a great topic to talk about. Oh, that's cool. And that's the thing is. And so what people don't understand is just because I posted this, the lady never even watched the whole thing. She wants us to come talk to her high school class. Oh, and she okay. has the veterinarian tech students. She wants us to come talk about empathy and stuff. And so I've been trying to get a hold of vets to figure out what's the differences and stuff. What do they do about mental health? Because people may not realize this, that uh, veterinarians, that's it's, what was the statistics? It was, okay, in the regular population, suicide rates of males are like three times more like, three to five times more likely. Yeah. But female veterinarians are three times more likely than the general public as a whole. So yes. does that mean that they're up there this close to or a little bit above? Are they 1.5 more likely than most males, or are they the same as the males? It's very interesting. I, uh, I haven't looked at the stats, but I um mm -hmm. I need to do it again. We did a uh, we did a Zoom meeting through Badgerland Reptile Rescue with those people who work in reptile rescue across the country. And we did a conversation on, on burnout and compassion fatigue yeah. and ways to kind of combat that. And that would be a conversation to have with people who work in vet clinics where there's just constant exhaustion and you're dealing with the really, really negative side of animal keeping, whether it's dogs and cats or whatever, you're dealing with animals that are sick and animals that are neglected and either intentionally not taking care of or accidentally not taking care of, and you're euthanizing animals. And, and the suicide rate is high because the stress is so high and the support is not there. And um, yeah, it's, it's, you know, we've, we had these zoom meetings and I need to do another one where we just talk about compassion fatigue and how do we recognize the signs and how do we deal with it and manage, manage it before it gets too bad. Um, Cause a lot of people, we you know people in the animal hobby, hobby, you know, your, your whole thing, Daniel is talking about empathy and how do we, you're always kind of assessing people that you talk to and you're reading their level of empathy and how does their empathy translate well, into their video. animal Come keeping on. and their interactions with others. And there are a lot of people who choose these, these fields. They choose reptile rescue or animal rescue or, you know, veterinary clinic because they have so much empathy for these animals and they carry that emotional burden when an animal doesn't make it or when an animal's mistreated and they want to rescue every animal. And that persistent stress of having to deal in that negative environment can be very taxing on you. And we already know that, emotional and mental health stress affects you physically as well. Yeah. And so, you know, we have to learn how to manage our own mental health and manage our physical health at the same time and learn to take care of ourselves and learn to have boundaries and learn to set limits. And, you know, the, the unpleasant, you know, disgusting reality of it is we can't save everything all of the time. Mm -hmm. Um, and there are, you know, but, but a huge key of it is recognizing it in ourselves or having friends. I don't know when I'm getting burned out, but my friends and family know when I'm getting burned out and will say, Bill, you might need to take a step back. And then I need to have the respect to listen to them and go, you're right. I do. I'm trying to get vets on to figure out how the vet industry is actually dealing with this. What are they doing in colleges to teach this? What's, what's this happening? Because uh, the lady in Canada who does a lot of the interviews, I talked to her and she, she can't do the interviews anytime soon, but she says there is something in Canada that they teach, they okay. teach about this kind of stuff. I don't know about America because one of the things that I was thinking was to actually create a buddy system in college. Okay. Where it's okay. So you have two vets and when you move out, even if you move across the country, you have to make a scheduled appointment with each other to talk 
every month or every other month. And, yeah, that's cool. And your staff has to have the, the phone number to that other vet. And so, therefore, if they think that you're down, they have the right to call that other vet to call you. I like that idea. That's very cool. You too. Like it's a actually, little like network support ne- network. Yeah. So, and who's yeah, going to know more cool. about what you're going through than another vet? Yeah. And teaching this in college, like, oh my God, yeah. And so it, it's just one of those things. Like, I love thinking of this stuff. This is what yeah. I keep talking yeah, about. I, I want to. I want to run for Congress. <laughs> I'm trying to get a guy on here that's the uh, oh uh, habitat stuff trying to plant stuff in Georgia that are native to America and get rid of all the other stuff, stop mowing, things like that. And I've got ideas for that, how we could actually get people psychologically to actually want to do this. If we can make it harder legally for cities and HOAs to actually enforce fines, then we could... for having a biodiverse lawn. Yeah. And so if we can, and some states are actually doing this, some freaking Michigan, California, some cities are actually doing this kind of thing. And so if we can do that, and then you work with the fire department and you actually burn your lawn so you can get the actual proper burnage and not burn down places. And then the native will actually grow back. And so then what happens is, that the HOAs and stuff, it's a protest against the HOAs. Yeah. Oh my God. How many people do you think would do that? Because it's a well, protest. It's good a luck getting that launched. A really good friend of mine just got a job um, for a company out of Appleton, Wisconsin. I can't remember the name of the company, but it's their landscapers that take on the mentality of, of, of landscaping with native plants and native flowers so they do landscaping in people's yards but they incorporate native species of flower native grasses native plants and that's really cool i want to do it in my backyard my front yard can be clean cut lawn whatever i don't do weed chemicals or nothing but i'll cut the front yard or whatever i'm my backyard i don't give shit it can grow i can have whatever native flowers back there my my landlord didn't mow my yard before i moved in so I broke my arm and I literally that night got my mower. So it's like I couldn't mow my yard. And then the city's telling me that they're going to find me $200 if I don't mow my yard. Like, well, I have a broken arm and my landlord's not going to do anything about this. They're not going to. So I have to mow my yard still. And I'm, but what bothers me the most is it was the health department. <laughs> really? Yeah, and so that that's a very interesting thing. What that tells me is that the city doesn't actually, like a lot of the health officials and stuff in the city don't actually fully understand health and how environmental things work. I, yeah, everyone has such a different perspective and then their personal opinions interfere with all of that. Yeah, it's very fascinating. And I mean, there's so many things we could go on with that, but uh, we were talking about, um, so I did do the episode where I summarized my findings and stuff. And I, okay. I used your clip where you talked about uh, the tortoise uh, on vacation and it's like, Bill's amazing. And he has all this on vacation. Yeah. You were talking, uh, we, I asked you to put yourself in the animal shoes. Oh yeah, 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 so, yeah, yeah. So that, yeah. And it's yeah, not that you're not creative or anything. I did not find creativity and empathy relation. I did not find that. A connection between creativity and empathy. Yeah, I really didn't find that. I don't, yeah, yet, those might not be connected. But yet, but yet, it really does seem like it has to have a form of imagination to be able to truly be that extra empathy, but you can overcome that with knowledge Yeah, and empathy and imagination on the same side of the brain, not that far apart. So that bridge is pretty easy to gap. And that's probably why you don't see it. Why we have empathy as a child, 
but yet you actually have to grow into it. And it's so hard to teach because that pathway, I bought a brain. <laughs> you showed me that. I know. You know how hard it is to buy a brain? Boy, that summer like a real human one. I know. I love that I have friends that, that actually said that. They were like, go down to the hospital or the local college and see if they I'm like I love yeah, that that just, yeah. I love they that you sell said extra that. Bones on Craigslist. Yeah, but I but I, I found that I had to order it from New York. So I saw, yeah. when I was in uh when I was an undergrad. Um, our site professor, this is like the 101 site classes. So you're in the big amphitheaters and there's 200 students and it's like a concert and the teacher's on stage. And he came in one day with like half of a brain. It was like, it was like half of a brain and it was cut on the side. So you could see the inside of it. You could see the stem and, but you know, you're way, he's on stage and you're way back and we're all, you know, freshmen in college watching this lecture. And, um, he's talking about this is the corpus callosum and this is the amygdala and here's the brainstem and about 20 minutes into the lecture he looks at the brain and then just takes a huge bite out of it it was cauliflower that he covered with jello to make it look like a brain but he had everybody in class fooled and 20 minutes later he just takes a huge bite out of it and the like horror gasp <laughs> from the audience from the, the students, it was hilarious. I don't it's know so if you nice. know this, but I love shock value. Yeah, I, I, would, I would love that. Well, I'm it's you know 30 years later, and I remember that happening, so yeah. it was so funny. So, I, I explained in that video, like we were talking about before, where you know the empathy is underneath. So, I can't <laughs> our pull, I, part. yeah, so I can pull this off, but I can't pull it off of my arm right now. Because it, it is, this is your your. Your cerebral is this whole thing, this top part, and it wrinkles as you learn new things and grow. But, and that creates more a surface area. That's why it wrinkles. But underneath is that empathy right about here, somewhere along this line. And your frontal lobe over here, I'm very curious about the frontal lobe. Is it something we have as birth and we develop it? Or does the actual neurons develop as we grow, because it doesn't fully establish till you're between 22 and 27. You are born with all of your parts of your brain. That's what you're I born with the frontal lobe. You're born with everything. And all of the neurons are there ready to go. So imagine you took 14 to 30, whatever um, extension cords and just laid them all out on the floor. You're born with all these neurons and all these synapses that could be ready to go. And then as you learn how to do things, as you learn to pinch and you learn to put fingers to your mouth and you learn to eat a drink out of a bottle and you learn these things, those extension cords get plugged in yeah. and the ones that are extra that you don't need die off. And so it, and it's similar to like, if you have, you know, the grass in your front yard, that's plain, and you could walk any path you want to walk, but if you keep walking the same path, yeah. your the the dirt will form and you'll form a stronger trail. Like your brain does that. So as you know, you're you're born with thousands and millions of these extra neurons, and as you learn a skill and you you hone in on that skill, those neurons strengthen. They call it myelinization. They get <laughs> they get stronger, and then the extra neurons that are ready to do those other things kind of fade off, but you're born with it all. Your, your frontal lobe is there. You have all the parts of the brain. They just become specialized as you learn new skills. And then you learn how to walk and you learn how to talk and you learn how to do all these things and all the neurons that are associated with that get stronger and the extra ones dissipate. That myelinization is what I think happens between empathy and your imagination that allows certain people to be more imaginative empathy wise to actually be able to put themselves in other people's shoes more. So do you think it requires a level of creativity and imagination to be able to put yourself in someone else's shoes and experience what they experience? Yes. But I'm, not yet, saying, not I'm not saying no, but I think that's, but I, I, don't, I, I don't think I've ever seen a study or read anything that like, com, like, like drew those together. So I, you very well might be onto something because yeah. I, 
You know, I, I, I work with kids on the autism spectrum and some of the kids on the autism spectrum have a very hard time we'll talk about that here in a minute. Imagining things or understanding if they haven't experienced it directly, they can't picture what it's like. But that doesn't mean they don't have empathy, but it kind of does. Like that's an interesting theory, Daniel. And it make and the theory makes sense to me after watching some uh, actual neuroscientists talk, I love neuroscience. This is the deal. So when we're talking about the brain, uh, your, your imagination, your, your memory and your imagination actually collect from the same sources almost. That's your whole, your whole cortex here. They're collecting from. So you don't actually have a true spot that is only memory and you don't really have a true spot that's only imagination. That actually pulls. So it's if you look at it as a, a retrieval system. And so if you actually – you can do this test. This is a home test, but it will give you a headache. And if you want to prove that the right brain – I mean, it controls the left side of the body. The left side of the brain controls the right side of the body. So if you want to okay. prove that your memory – is in the left side of your brain and the imagination is in the right side, you can. If you try to look straight ahead and then you actually try to imagine something, your eyes will automatically dart to the left, showing okay. the, the right side of your brain. Well, if you try to memorize something, you try to imagine or uh, pull up your memory of something, your eyes will automatically dart to the right. Up and down confuses me. But it's the same thing. There is an actual difference. And so that. You muted yourself. I keep unplugging my mic. I got to. Is that what happened? Yeah, I keep. So we'll move that. So, yeah, so that. And when you look at neuro scans and you look at actual empathy, they'll show this spot and they'll show this spot. This is the right side of the brain, everybody. So this actually is also where you find your imagination. This is also the spot where autistic kids often have the most issue. Yeah. So therefore we could actually say that, and this would explain why as a kid you would go, okay, so I have like, if when I talk about my arm and people go, Oh my, Oh, like that's empathy. They're using this modeling part, but they might see it. They might not, not every imagination sees things. Sometimes they hear it. Sometimes they actually taste it. There's more to your imagination than just seeing. But for me, my whole set here should be a actual myelin should have actually adapted. This is why no matter what I do, I can empathize with everything and I don't have a choice and I see it in my head. And if I see it in my head, it automatically goes, okay. So, but yet if you yawn, I don't yawn because I've taught myself. I feel it, but I don't do it because my frontal lobe automatically goes, okay. And so then my empathy is actually working. <laughs> I'm feeling what you're feeling, but then I also have my imagination connected to it very deeply where I'm actually seeing it because my imagination must be connected to my cerebral cortex. And so this, this is an actual direct pathway. So it's actually very interesting that I would have that direct pathway. And the more myelin, the faster those pathways move. How do you know you have that direct pathway? Because you, have you, you haven't seen your brain, have you? I know, right? Like, I don't, I can't tell you 100%, but it would explain how come if I listen to an audiobook, I see it, I feel it, and like, I, I literally feel it, and I actually see it. And I imagine it. I was waiting for you to say you taste it. I don't, don't taste, taste the audiobook. <laughs> Surprisingly, but, I don't. But yeah. Yeah, it's it's the the I don't I can't deny or approve of what you just said. Like I yeah. the, the human brain is incredible. It's absolutely an incredible organ. And so, um, and so yeah. That's that's interesting. I, I'm trying to think of where I want to go with this because there's 50 different paths I could take. So there are. So Lord Weaver Webb. I know. Do we want to talk about? 
You've got me for 60 more minutes. So whatever you would like to talk about, I'm all yours, man. So uh, the people that actually do rescues and become abuse victims that actually become rescues themselves, like Keeley, or do we want to talk about neurodivergence, or do we actually want to get into the chart that I make? It's entirely true, sir. So, because they all lead to each other. It's just, where do we start? Okay. So. My lighting is really strange, and I look like I have lipstick on. <sighs> um, whatever you'd like to talk about, sir. So. What do you want to talk about regarding neurodivergence? <laughs> I wanted to, to, to go over what I talked about. Okay. okay. So, when we think about neurodivergence, this is an actual proven thing. You know this as well as I do that before the age of two, some part, and I don't love using neurodivergent to explain autistic because I think neurodivergent should be its own thing and it should include autism, but because the brain takes, has so many pathways, there is to calling people neuro. And I don't under, like, I'm very curious why, Everywhere, not just the reptile community. I've heard it multiple times in the reptile community that we must be neurodivergent. But yet, because they're saying it in other things too, like there's an increase in neurodivergency is what everybody's saying. They're using it as a more politically correct term rather than saying yeah. a mental health diagnosis or a, or a, you know, an issue or whatever. I mean, they, they're, you know, ADHD and anxiety and social anxieties and autism, and they all, they're all neurodivergent because they, they fall from the, the, the neurotypical, but I, and th- I'm probably new and unique um, in this regard, but this is like, for my arm, but I am championing your your talk. There you go. Woo! Yeah. How do we like? I I just I don't like the word normal, and I I said this in other podcasts too. Like, what's normal like- for me is very different from what's normal for you. And defining the word normal is a very subjective thing, you know. And that goes People, into what that goes yeah. into the chart that I made. What do you think? Of so that chart? I think a lot of us are neurodivergent because I just don't think that people are normal or neurotypical, yeah. but I think there's just a general, you know, there's just a general, like, okay, here's a, here's a group of behaviors and here's a group of socially ex- accepted norms that we follow. And most people fall into that norm and in, in how we present ourselves in public and how we socialize with others. And, and we'll get back to that here in just a our second. Thinking, our thinking and our processing of information kind of falls into this average type of mindset that we call neurotypical. And if you fall outside of that realm, you're neurodivergent, but it's a, it's a nicer and more acceptable way to talk yeah. about people with autism or ADHD. And I, but I do just, love the term nor, neurodivergent. I actually love it. Cause it actually I'm not against it at all. I, 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 I like it way more than saying neurotypical or normal yeah. because th- that's such a subjective definition. It is. For people. So, my thought. Know, you know, as well as I do, what, what happens in an autistic person's brain is by the age of two, something is enlarged. Usually it's this cortex at the top, but it may be something inside of the brain. There is something that has actually been enlarged Sorry, in I'm the back. brain. No, there's something that's been enlarged in the brain before the age of two. And so if we actually take from what I talked about, so if you have a much bigger of this already and you're not and it's not developed now this pathway is even worse. I and I I would have to read some studies and read some articles cuz I I'm not familiar with a lot of that stuff. I the brain can only get so much bigger yeah. because there's not a lot of space in your skull yeah. for your brain. There's only a very little bit, but I um yeah, I would need to research that a little bit more before I could comment on that. I haven't I think, seen a I lot of them. I think he would be okay with me talking about this. The guy from uh, Reptile Studio Podcast, the guy with uh, ADHD that had to take medication, he talks – I've talked to him a little bit with this, and he does get headaches. He's an awesome guy. Yeah, 
And I, I love and that. And he's very, he's very open about some of his challenges and some and of the things great. he said. I was happened. just talking to him like two nights ago. He's a very cool guy. They're both, they're both really good dudes. That's a I great podcast. Have, I would love to come on their show and talk to him about this kind of stuff. Cause yeah, they're is, awesome. This is why that they would have trouble. If this is already increased more than a normal person's, then this pathway is not functioning correctly because there's already stuff blocking that. So they, I'm sure with more time, they could go around it or through it. Yes. But that requires more time. And you said something on one of the podcasts, and I, I called you on it a little bit last time we were here, but it's very interesting because you talked, we talked about like if that your body language was so positive about reptiles that they'll spend more time with the reptiles. But it may actually still be the reptiles themselves that make them spend that time with it. And so that extra time is allowing this to be created. That's why they can empathize with that animal, but they can't empathize with a person because of how this, this connection came about. Okay. That makes sense to me. Like, and cause like you said, everything's a connection. You have your frontal lobe already. So why doesn't it automatically happen while you're a child? Cause you have to build that connection. The and connections so, have to build. Yeah. And so when they do study empathy, I've seen brain scans from neuroscientists where they do show, like I said before, this part and this part of which your imagination is back here. So it makes sense that that would have to connect. I think there is a correlation. I think there is yeah. a correlation between creativity, imagination, and empathy. And that's why I, I said, I don't know if creativity, I would add that because I didn't see that. Okay. As much, but, but then that calls into question the imagination part of it, but how much imagination goes into creativity. It's very fascinating because that's a very interesting question. I don't know how to approach that because I really did not find a correlation between creativity of people and their empathy. So I have a question for you. A, how, how did you find yourself in this position where this, the, the topic of empathy has become so important in your endeavors. Like what led you to like, kind of really jump on this whole notion of empathy and exploring empathy. It's cause it's, 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 you know, I, I work with kids and I work with kids of all ages and I work with kids who have, you know, ADHD or anxiety or depression. I do work with kids on the autism spectrum. I work with kids who have had adverse child uh, experiences and traumatic experiences. And we could teach social skills and we could teach communication and we could teach coping skills. Uh, empathy is a very difficult and a very challenging thing to teach. But to me, that's Other kids, and especially kids who need to be taught things explicitly. And again, I hate to use the word, but like neurotypical kids yeah. can learn through natural consequences. They can be at the playground or they can be at school and they can have an experience with other kids where they can learn, oh, that didn't feel good or I don't like that. Or I said this mean kid, mean thing to this kid and the way he responded didn't feel good. So I'm not going to say mean things to kids. And um, a lot of kids with, you know, neurodivergence need to be taught things explicitly that other kids might just learn independently. And in that regard too, it's very challenging and very hard to teach empathy. It, we do it. We don't ever stop trying to do it, yeah. but it's a lot more, it's a lot more simple than like, Hey, you just, you just punched that kid. Well, how would it feel if I punched you? That's not teaching empathy, but it's, you have to use your imagination. Uh, it's my a lot father, more complicated than that. But so father, I'm curious on where, like, like what brought you into like being so motivated and driven by this topic? It's actually very, I, it, when, when I think about it, it's very common. The reason why I do it okay, as, as a child, I had a lot of anger issues because okay. I felt unfair. My brother was learning disabled. I, I've explained this before. You've talked about that before. Yes. Yeah. Correct. My brother's learning disabled. So I got in trouble when he would act out and I would not take it. I was a kid. So yeah. I always felt like I was the victim. 
there was a problem here. My brother would act out, so I would not tolerate it. So therefore, I would get in trouble as well. And so for me, that's unfair. Yeah. And when we actually hear about society, we actually hear people talk about politics. And it's not even necessarily that they think that uh, that there's a problem. They think it's unfair. They use that word a lot. Now, when you actually study, I've heard studies in politics where people are actually talking and they always talk about being unfair. So it's a very common yeah. thing to feel unfair. So for me, I grew up with those anger issues and those anger issues actually help people with their empathy. When you grow up like that, I've heard I've heard studies that actually say if you can learn to control your anger. Learning to control your anger. And this is something I want to bring up with that guy that off of the podcast with uh, Greg there. He talked about having uh, anger. I wonder if he's more empathy now than before. And has that helped him out with the animals? I would I love to hear you ask him that question. That's cool. I would love to hear that. I would love to know that part because this is what I'm, this is. I've been telling people this for a long time because of my anger issues as a child and learning to control them. I still have them today. My dad's still like, no, Daniel, we're scared. You're going to kill somebody. And I'm like, I can't tell you you're wrong, but I have massive control over my anger. So I, I have massive control. And that led me to having more empathy. But it's not just that. I grew up almost an only child. And you probably know as well as I do that an only child means you have more imagination. So therefore... Those two things combined. When I say I grew up as an only child, it's not I grew up in the city with a bunch of friends and stuff. No, I grew up in the countryside where I didn't have a kid that lived near me, my age, till I was in junior high. Wow. Within a mile. I lived wow. out in the countryside. So, yeah, I developed an imagination. So this, so this would explain why my myelin would connect those dots so thoroughly. Yeah. Yeah. Like it makes perfect sense. It's, our, it's our childhood experiences definitely shape us and definitely shape how our brains get wired. And so after our last talk, so <laughs> see, this was really cool. Like when you brought up attunement, I kind of brushed it off. I know you've done that to me, but then I came back. And it's really cool when you, when you start doing this because it was, Don't it was great. Don't me off, man. <laughs> I, it's, it's very like, no, like, like I can't help it. My brain goes, like, like if you give me a problem, give me two weeks and yeah. I'll have an answer. Okay. Like it's, just, like, it's the weirdest shit. Like, my brain just does it i don't have a choice you're good man that's cool yeah this so, is cool so we see the uh, attunement here that i made in this chart did you actually look at this chart i have been too busy sir i haven't looked at anything so like i explained i look at now. facebook for five minutes as i'm going to the bathroom and then i'm about my day so i apologize so, so attunement you can do attunement with any system any system can be attuned to economics, politics, freaking uh, the actual bi uh, bacteria you can attune to the um, the when I worked at Lazy Boy, they had different uh, sewing machines and they all had different personalities to those sewing machines because they wore down differently. So therefore you had to attune to those. That's a great example of how human beings are right there. The way we are maintained and wore down creates what we can in tune to what we actually can be affected by. It's a great analogy. And so, okay. so when we look at this, any system can be attuned to any system at all. But that stuff that I talked about last time, that's what affects what you can attune to. So you can take from what somebody can attune to and you can look here. So a bacteria, would you be able to empathize with a bacteria? No. You could probably use some imagination, but knowledge, you would definitely use knowledge. <laughs> and then you could actually, the people you spend time with would also be very important. 
because you want to have you know microbacteria people that actually understand the topic around Do bacteria the have feelings that's why we can't we don't know that's the thing maybe do they have neurons i don't know it's very but yet i don't think they do <laughs> it's but that's knowledge I could be wrong that's knowledge not empathy and so like i said before i added fear down here at the bottom because fear's more of a negative thing that happens to what you can attune to and it's it's not as strong as knowledge knowledge can usually overcome fear a lot and how so, are you how are you defining attunement in this graph just I the know. sense of being aware of something else's emotional state attuning attuning to something is is being consciously aware of their emotional state and it's similar to empathy I but would say I'm using it that way. I would say I'm kid, using it as to... If your child is angry or sad, you have a human child who's angry or sad, and your facial expressions yeah. and your nonverbal communication can show that you understand that kid is angry or sad. And yes, and that would... That, it's see, the it's way like attunement is you can attune to any system. So but how can, can you, how can a sewing machine be sad? But that's the thing is I'm not taking it that way. I'm taking it as you can understand it in a way that you can actually. I would I would challenge you that that's not what I mean when I talk about yes, attunement. I don't think that's what you mean. It's related to I mean. emotion, emotional states, and I don't think sewing machines get angry or sad, but that sounds like a really good Pixar movie. Yeah. Yeah, but it still but goes back to this chart and sewing machines of what affects what you can attune. But to. I, but what you're, yeah, what you're talking about is like a deeper understanding of something. Yeah, like and a, understanding like, a system and how a system works, and understanding how a system works, whether it's a mechanical system like a sewing machine, or an organic system like a human or a bacteria. Understanding the system and how it works can make you more responsive to that system maybe is what you're concluding it's, it's listening to people talk about a subject you can understand what they can attune to and then you can go from there and look at this piece of the chart and you could say okay so if you're talking about the child and it's crying and you're like okay so this thing we need to try milk we need to do this you are empathizing using your imagination most likely and your knowledge, and it's possible that the who you spend time with is also affecting this. So all these things would have a bigger impact on that. Okay. Whereas bacteria, you're just going to use knowledge and who you spend time with, maybe a little imagination, but not empathy. But most of the time when you're seeing this, I, I don't love what I've done with empathy here, but it's where I'm at right now. And I, I would okay. like to challenge it, but I, right now is I have where, you know, you have one, no empathy two hard for them to empathize. Then you have three is just a normal empathy. And then four is empathy because of experience where five is extra empathy using your imagination. Like it literally is tied into how you imagine and that helps. But once again, I have knowledge above it because I do believe knowledge is more important. If you, if you don't have knowledge on how to make a bottle and that the child needs a bottle, can you really empathize that the child needs a bottle? Yeah. Yet, you can still empathize with that. And it's very interesting. And then we have the last part of what, of what creates these things is your trauma, your past, your childhood, your genetics. Not everything is trauma. Not everything is your past. Not every, your past is not always your childhood. Trauma isn't always in the past. The uh, vets that we were talking about, probably trauma in the now. But yet, when you talk about empathy and imagination, you are probably going to have to go back to childhood. And genetics also plays a part. My father is more, you would say he was more empathetic, but yet, and that comes down to probably something I heard a lot as a child. Put yourself, you know, imagine what they're going through. Imagine what they're going through. Imagine, imagine, imagine. Yeah. 
If you're not going to finish your dinner, there are kids who are starving. Yeah. Imagine, yeah. Gosh. And so this is very interesting. So we can look back at like Keeley. And so I have like these these uh, different colors that I use. That's a uh, wrong way. But I use these different colors to to kind of show this, what affects it, how it like. And so we could think about Keely being more empathetic to animals more than she is to people. She has a trauma childhood. She's admitted to that. Otherwise I wouldn't have talked about it. I know how you are. She and said so, it publicly. Yeah. So that's, and I love, she's amazing. And she, I respect her as much as I respect Emily from snake discovery. A, a massive great person and has great knowledge, massive knowledge, almost probably close to a lot of knowledge that you have with reptiles. But I, oh, think I would, I would, I would say Emily has way more knowledge than me. I, I, was, talking, I was talking about, um, uh, uh, Keely. Keely. Okay. Yeah. And I would I say don't know Keely, her well enough to assess yeah, Keely, that. Keely has more imagination and empathy than most likely you do when they're connected. But you were really cool with your creativity there. And I, I would say that your imagination may not be like super high compared to Keely. And so that's still like, that's very interesting. Well, I'm let down, man. No, you shouldn't be. Because honestly, you were one of the reasons why I think of creativity. Because when you talked about, because I'm, I'm literally pulling all this from memory, because it, it literally, like, I still think about this stuff. When you talked about the CPAC, machine that you made for the reptile <coughs> oh my oh, god that was yeah that was so cool yeah that's, that's super creative but i don't see your imagination up to keely's which i, I find fascinating to well me. now it's a competition because now i'm now i'm i'm taking it as a challenge <laughs> to step up my i don't i don't know how much imagination i need to implement because I feel like imagination is thinking about things that maybe don't exist or yeah. we don't have tangibly. But when we're working with reptiles, there's everything is tangible about them. Yeah. We know we know what environments they come from. We know what, what diets they have. We know what their experiences are in their natural world. And I don't think it requires imagination as much as it requires creativity. Creativity would be decorating their vivarium and providing enrichment and Coming up with, you know, ways to make a, a, a water type waterfall in a cage or whatever. But see, like uh, for me, nation would then be separate, I think, from that. But that's just me. See, for me, I have a shitload of knowledge already <laughs> and I have a massive amount of empathy and a massive imagination. I can connect all those dots to where I don't actually have to go back and do this massive amount of research on everything because I have this weird understanding. Like I said, I've taken videos of me actually communicating with giraffes in the zoo. It's weird, but it's, I do like, I, I understand what they're trying to say, what they want, what they like. It's, it's very fascinating. And it, it has taken me down dark paths with them. It's taken me down positive paths. Uh, it's very fascinating. Uh, I stuck them in the window here or uh, not just the window, but I have a room and I leave the windows open. My Cuban night seems so much happier in that bigger tank where he can look out the window. He positions himself almost every day to be able to look out that window. It's really fascinating. I think he's so much happier being able to do that. I took, oh, I, I, took uh, I let my animals free roam in that room. I have a video where I have my blind Peter bandit skin, the gecko. He trapped himself in a, in a, uh, a freaking, uh, a, uh, lamp. It's, it's so cute. It's super cute. But, um, uh, I took my Savannah's out and I let him run around the room and hate my mail. I picked him up. And when I took him out a long time ago to the lake and I had him in a dog bag that you would take a dog out in and there's screens on it. And he spent the day doing this on that screen. He was very, cause normally they hide and the next day he hid all day. He was just so tired. I'm sure. But he was very excited to see everything. 
So when I picked him up, he fought me a little bit. But when he got to see the window, he licked me. I think he was more like licking the air because he calmed down and just like, oh. And he ended up licking me. So he calmed down. He was happy because he got to see the excitement of that. Uh, last night, I took Houdini, my Peter Bandit. I have Houdini and Broken escaped the night that I moved in. Uh, Houdini's named for escaping. Yeah. She's my, she's my female. I assume, I assume that. <laughs> yeah, it's very fascinating. I found her the next morning, and it took me two more days to find Broken. Broken is the rarest Peter Bandit skink in the world. He has three broken stripes that are like half stripe. One goes this way and then goes this way. And then the other one goes this way. Okay. Yeah. I've got it on the video. Like it's, he's, he's from the original three that I got. He's very, I don't know. He's different than the others. Maybe a little depressed. I don't know. But Houdini was out. I took her out and she starts panicking and I put her in the window. She's still panicking, wanting out. It's like, okay, I get this. I put her away. She's happy to be away. I took Broken, I set him on the floor because sometimes he won't eat in the enclosure. But if I throw a worm on the floor, he'll go get it. And so I'm trying to feed him. He's in shed, so he's probably not going to eat. It's like, that's fine. And so I set him in the window. And he's trying to get away from me, but he's not panicking. So he's like, I want to move away from you, but I'm not really like scrambling to do it. Like he's very confused, I'm sure. Is more what I took it as. And yeah. so as, as he walks across the actual window seal, he catches a glimpse out of his eye of the outside world. And he stops where he was heavy breathing. And I don't know what it was about this moment. I don't know how I feel about this moment. I don't know if it was a positive or a negative in the long run for him. But it just... I don't know. There's a little part of it that just broke my heart Okay. And that he might have like, he wanted out, not out of fear. So I've got a bearded dragon who spends a lot of her days depressed. And so when I take her swimming, she loves swimming, like loves it. Like, like just, just has a ball. I it's like that the pantomime of your bearded dragons. Yeah, like, like, <laughs> like I'm seeing in my head as I'm talking about it. But no, that other night, like I, I think about this stuff. And this is what vets and stuff probably go through. People at rescues. They probably have these moments where it's like, man, I don't know if that animal's depressed. I don't know if I'm giving him the best life. I don't, I mean, just these these negative thoughts because I felt that animal have a thought that I don't know was positive or negative. Whereas I knew Houdini was like, I'm freaking out here. And I knew, uh, hate my Savannah monitor was happy. He's like, Oh, this is really cool. Where... I don't think we could ever know what our animals are thinking. And, and then... I don't think we could ever know what our animals are feeling, but I think we can tell yeah. when they're having a harder time in their energy levels and we can gauge is it because they need enrichment or they need food or they need water or they need sunlight and uv and i think we're able to tell when our animals are content and happy and i think we can tell when our animals are struggling um and we provide their basic needs. We provide their, do you have the right UV? Do you have the right basking temperature? Do you have the right humidity? Are you eating? Are you drinking clean water? Is there enrichment? Are we offering new and novel things for you to experience? So and I, I, I think... I think, you know, I think you and a lot of keepers are on to something in understanding that it's not just let me feed it and give it water in a basking spot. Like our animals need more than that. They need enrichment, natural, providing natural enclosures and natural I'm setups as best as we can, can I'm be sorry, enrichment for animals. We're providing a variety of different food items where it's something different, a new smell, a new cage decor, rearranging your cage decor. There's a whole lot of things that we can do. We might never know what our animals are thinking and exactly what our animals are, are feeling. We might think we do, but I think in those efforts to always try to provide the best yeah. home and the best environment, for our animals, no one can say anything negative about that. 
Yeah, no. And I talked about this on the sur- the summary deal. I'm trying not to cry right now because, like, it really, like, it, it actually breaks my heart to think that he's sad. I know it does. I know. I'm sorry. But this is good. This is actually something that we... Yeah. Uh, people don't give enough credit to this. No. If you're, if you're not seeing somebody talk about their animal in any, any way like this, then... If you actually listen to Bob Clark or uh, oh, what's his name, uh, uh, Samson Pruitt, they never talk about the animals like this. They only talk about the business side, and they go, "Well, it's about the animal." They don't cry when their animal passes away. No, they don't. They, they, they it's about the money, and it's not necessarily that they that they may lack empathy. There's <laughs> other issues that they have. And people like I, I explained on the ep- on the episode, I am trying to manipulate everybody, but what I do it for is for that. Uh, there's a quote that I like from Gandhi. Follow me here, because uh, I think this is important for our our subject. I'm paraphrasing because it's a long quote. Uh, I would rather men be violent when there's violence in their hearts than put on the mask of nonviolence to cover up impotency. Because there is hope for a violent man to be nonviolent. There is no hope for impotency. And I think the people that are, these animals have no feeling, they have no desire, they have no thinking, are impotent. There's, there's almost so little way to get to them. Whereas if you have somebody that's going, this animal loves me. I hear it all the time. I'm like, I hold on a second. I don't know if they love you, but they have probably bonded with you. And those people are more than happy to go, okay, I'll accept that. So it's easier to get those people to come down than it is for bring the other people up. If I, yeah, if I, and we could argue all night long, does my animal love me back? Does my animal know I exist? If, if, if that mentality of thinking or hoping or wishing that your animal loves you and, and cares about you just like you care about it, and if that motivates and informs your desire to take better care of that animal, fantastic. That's it, 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 We don't need to sit and argue about yes. what's my animal thinking, what's my animal wishing, does my animal wish to be this or that? How can I, but, but if it, if it informs us and, and, and motivates us to, can I do better? Does my animal need a bigger case? Does my animal need a varied diet? Then who cares? It doesn't matter. We, we could argue until we're blue in the face, but if you're doing a good job taking care of your animal, then that's, that's what counts. I think, you know, it, it's kind of a pet peeve to me when I see like, and I know I'm sounding like an old, you know, crabby Gen X guy, but I get like really annoyed with the whole, like, danger noodle boop your snoot people saying snack and like it's like drives me nuts like it's it sounds so silly to me but if those people care about these animals and they have these silly nicknames and boop and snoots or whatever but they're putting their hearts and their compassion into providing the best home for their animals that's fantastic that's good this is the thing with like the attunement the way i take it of being able to, if you can do that with knowledge or you have to use empathy and imagination to do that, whatever gets you to that boat to where you can truly attune with your animal. I think we're all for it. Agreed. I agree with you on that. And so when we look at this, we can say back to uh, Keely, <coughs> she has the knowledge. She has empathy for animals. She has imagination for animals. Way more imagination than I do. and so when we look at what might cause that we know she had childhood trauma but we also know that uh the late one of the ladies that runs three sisters rescue i can never remember her name she's awesome amazing she took kind of took her in as an adult and so she surrounded herself with her and so that would also increase her love for animals and her knowledge of animals and stuff like that. So who's she spending that time with? Which goes back to my past. Uh, I've seen it where my my dad's ex-wife's son, my cousin who's – my mother's side of the family is basically all druggies. And so she got kicked with uh, my family when her dad died and mom ran off. 
And so my dad does not do drugs. My, my mother's not a good person, but she saw the way my dad was living and the way my dad did shit. And so she doesn't do drugs now. She has a full-time job that she's satisfied with everything because she was able to see that. So she went through childhood trauma and came out the other side. And I do wonder now, if now that I think about it, I wonder if she has more empathy. Uh, my dad's ex-wife's kid wrote me back a while back. And yeah, he was probably on the verge of being a druggie. Got to be introduced to my dad, got into that, got to see what my dad's life was like and how my dad handled shit. And now he's a diesel mechanic with a family. He's not a druggie. It's interesting when you are introduced to people that way. So tra these are ways that we can affect childhood trauma to, to add to that empathy that they probably developed through the anger that they probably had during childhood trauma. They probably learned to control it during this time too, increasing their empathy. There's probably a lot of these things in their childhood from this. That's probably the things that happened to Keely. Maybe. And that's why she has that empathy. That's why she, she spends that extra time learning that knowledge of these animals. That's, and it, I love it. I mean, it's, it's one of those things where it's, it's the reason why we can see some people that come out of trauma as kids turn back into trauma. They literally continue the cycle. They know no other way. Yeah, because I was going to say, I know people who have had childhood experiences that were bad and they didn't heal from it and they grew up and they don't have empathy for others and they don't even have a compassion for themselves. So it, I, I think I think, you know, I think you're on to something. Um, and I'm very curious about the direction that you continue to go with what you're looking into. Um, I'm, I'm definitely interested in the connection between imagination and creativity and empathy. Um, very always my profession leads me down the path of understanding, you know, how childhood trauma and adverse childhood experiences can impact your ability to empathize with others. Cause I've seen it go both ways. Um, yeah, it's good. It's it's interesting. Yeah, I uh, I did an interview. I used uh, M95 Genetics and uh, Dakota from DBBC Exotics, and like I explained that you know you could hear the difference in the way M95 talked. He literally talked about his animals as a relationship, and I didn't prompt him or Keely to really talk about these animals this way. And that's just the way they are. So you could see that he had that more empathy. And I talked about the fact that I, I do a lot of times take control of the conversations, but I don't have a lot of people on that. I feel are up to par with me on the topic. I'm really trying to use you to study this. Not, I don't want to hear your opinion on empathy because yeah, you've got empathy. Woo. Great. Show me. That's what I'm looking for. Show me that you do it. And we could see that uh, Dakota would take over the conversation when I would take too much control over it. But what I loved about Dakota, I love this, is that he would give the control to M95. Okay. I'm like, no, like it's probably something that most people don't see. They probably would just see me as an asshole and they probably wouldn't think about that. But like I said before, before the interview, I like to give props. I want to give credit where credit's due. And I want people to understand that I do appreciate that shit. I, even if you're taking control over me, but he's not doing it for selfish reasons. He's doing it to, to, to give that other person something. And I can't tell you how much I love that. Right on. I mean, I'm just like, no, that, and you know, I'm, I understand it. So it's one of those things where I just love that. Um, so we, so like I said, all those things came together where we saw, uh, way Keeley and the trauma and the chart and the neuroscience and how uh, neurodivergence works to all that as well. 
why that would have an impact your genetics yeah that would it would change the way you couldn't connect those dots and create that neuroscience to that but what if they did a different pathway and then what if the, it's it's so interesting it's just so uh the end of that video since we're talking about like people with imagination well not everybody's going to have massive imagination so I have the end of the episode with Ryan McVeigh and he actually said something that, Oh my God, I just love this. I have posted it. And anytime I get a comment on it, they're like, yeah, this is freaking yes. He talked about putting himself in the animal shoes. Yeah. Sending a camera through his enclosure. Yeah. I'm like, yes, I'm doing that in my imagination. I'm thinking about the way this animal's popping up. I can do that. Not everybody can. So therefore, using a camera to do that. Hallelujah. We have yeah. a freaking answer. Do that, guys. Do that. There's yeah. so much you can learn from their animal, too. Oh, my God. I've learned so much. Like, I have literally learned to deal with other people even in a, a, a different way and stuff. Yeah. But I, also, I also think about how animals deal with other animals. There are other kind crows and stuff. Actually, if you're a greedy person in a, as a crow, they're going to kick you out of their society. And I think about that in our society. It's like, yeah, uh, I got some flying geckos. You were telling me about that. I, they're very I, cool. This is something about breeders. Like I can, oh my God, this is, this goes back to empathy through experience. I got to try and adjust here. Uh, when, Go ahead. I'm listening to you. I'm just when, adjusting when Brian, myself. When Brian Barchuk talks about uh, boas, not breeding boas because it breaks his heart because of how many of them die. I just experienced yeah. with the flying geckos, they can't, they had eggs. It was, it's actually a really funny story. And so, uh, I, I was at Petco and they had flying geckos. I went back like a week later and I was like, okay, you have them on sale. And I'm like, how many's in there? He's like three. If I take all three, how much would you get me for them? So I, I got them for like 20 bucks a piece. Wow. Yeah. And they were like, well, they were like 49 or 59 at first. And then they were marked down, but I took all three, but we saw that there was the, the decor had eggs on it attached. And it's like, okay, I'll take those two. And they're white. But one yeah. has a dimple. But the other one looks fantastic. Even Ryan was like, yeah, no, that looks really good. Okay. And, and so uh, the guy came out and he goes, yeah, I'm, I'm scared they're going to bite me. I'm like, I'll take care of it, dude. I'll, I'll grab them. And I get that it's it's a business and they don't want me doing it for insurance purposes. Right. That with a garden glove, a big leather glove. To capture flying geckos, something the size of an emerald swift, something you know, like literally the the literally the size of this lengthwise. And he goes it would to, be easier to catch them by letting them bite you and then he, moving them into the so box. Yeah, and yeah. So one one lost its tail because he did that. Oh no! Yeah, I started. It started to piss me off because the other one, the little one that was next to the eggs when we found it ran up him and jumped on the enclosures and ran behind them. They're crazy oh, little things. Oh, it started to piss me off. I'm like, just let me do it. And he goes, yeah. okay, okay. So I'm one handed and I still, catch Oh, them. you did it with your, with your thing. Yeah. And they still, they bit me every one of them. And my, skinks, they do. You're they, fine. My, my skinks bite harder. And I don't want to yeah. like, like I, well, this guy, like, I don't want to be like, Oh, well, you know, he should not care that they bite him. It's more that he should have recognized that I would deal with them better. Not that he was scared to be bit. When you're not afraid to get bit, you're a little bit more confident in handling. Yeah. And what's interesting with these guys is it feels like, because I, when I got him home, I took him into the bathroom and caught him. And they, he put him in a big box. And so they all came out at once. And they're fast. <laughs> yeah, they are. Yeah, it's like, oh, but... Uh, the one that fell, went behind the enclosure, he saw the silhouette 
And so we're like, oh, okay. So we moved the thing and I was able to grab it and none of them really moved. And so when I got them home and we did the same thing where when they, when they finally stopped and they planted themselves and they spread out, I'm sure in the wild they do that. And then they're confident that you can't see me. And when they're right. on that decor, oh my God, you can't. No. You, you literally got to be like, they're very, very cool animals. They really are. So, but once they very establish cool, yeah. that, they just stop and they're easy to catch. Yeah. Once they, they, they just stop. Mm -hmm. and it's, it's like, yeah. So, me and I was talking to Ryan about it, and it's like, it feels like they sit around the eggs. Like somebody goes to protect them. They might. It feels like maybe. I can't tell you that that's exactly what happened because they're in that decor and maybe that one because they don't seem to like to spend time with each other, but one will usually go into that decor. They but very well might like cocaine okay do. Yeah. And I don't, I don't know if that's true or not, but going back to the breeder. It's true thing, that tokays do. Yeah. And I going back to the, the breeder thing, I feel like shit. Like I do. Like when this, when I did this, I feel like shit. I'm like, what do you I, mean? I read up and I know they don't need too high of temperature, but no. the, house, the house temperature is 72. It says the eggs need to incubate at 78. Yeah. So it's like, okay, I'll put a heat lamp in that room, set it a distance. So we're talking about like, like way the hell over here. That heat lamp was. And okay. I popped, I popped the eggs. Oh. I feel like shit. Yeah, that sucks. Like, it it literally like I'm like, are you kidding me? It makes you not want to breed. It's it, like, yeah, I, it's it sets it's you so, back emotionally. It does, and I see and more you that, bounce back. Yeah, and you I figure see more it out. But the big one did have something meaty in it, some little dot. I don't know if it was viable or not. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I don't know if they're male or females because I haven't been – because of the arm, I haven't really been able to get a good check. Well, if you have eggs, then at least one's a female. <laughs> yeah, that's kind of the thing. Is And since they're not attacking each other, I'm pretty sure that two or more are female. Okay. Kind of thing. So, Because I got them all in the same enclosure for quarantining. I hate to be a party pooper. I have about 10 more minutes, then I have to sign off. Well, we covered a lot of the stuff I wanted to cover. So, okay, good. And 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 so thinking about this as trauma, what's some of your takeaways from this? Um it 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 really leads our conversations always lead me to wanting to have more conversations and wanting to figure things out more because I think we go in tangents when we talk, you and I, and I'm just as guilty of it, but I think that's good because I think there's so much more to say. And I don't think the topic is just like a, like a cut and dry linear topic. I think it begs other questions and wants us to move in other directions. I um, am definitely, um, I'm very interested in, in looking more into your theories on, how childhood traumas affect empathy, because I would always be concerned that those who have experienced adverse childhood traumas would have less empathy. See, um, anger, anger. Because I've anger. watched kids, you know, hurt animals and do aggressive yeah. things. Um, but I think you're right. I think overcoming that trauma could lead to a greater understanding. And you're connect. You're 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 wanting to connect creativity and imagination with empathy is something that I've really never thought of. And so it's, it's, it, it, it's, it's making me interested in looking into it a little bit more because empathy is a very, it's a very challenging topic. Um, I think a lot of it is learned. I think, I think we learn empathy in our experiences with other, but I think there also is an innate, an innate desire to empathize and I, again, I going back, I think we talked about it before in a previous conversation. I think we're born with the desire to, with, with the ability to empathize. And I think our experiences can either nurture that and foster that or affect that negatively. But I think we, uh, we have, 
we're wired to empathize at birth. We are wired to empathize at birth. And I talked to you in the last podcast about mirror neurons and we have these mirror neurons. That's, <laughs> that's the part of the empathy. And that's, that is another evidence for us being wired to empathize from birth and mirror neurons. Any of you guys listening, if you have a baby, you know, between three to six months old, and you smile and laugh at the baby, the smile, the baby's going to smile and laugh back at you. And that's what mirror neurons are. They are how babies learn re facial recognition and facial expressions and, and feelings and all that kind of stuff. Um, and so, you know, we talked about it the last time. I think humans are born with the ability to empathize. We're born wired to do that. And then we have experiences that could impair that or affect that. And then we can learn to overcome those as well. But you, there's resilience and there's all these other human qualities that, that play into it as well. But I, I enjoy our conversations a lot. I enjoy, um, I appreciate you being flexible with me because I'm not always, I don't always have free time to, to yeah, chat. This, after this stuff that happened to me, it's kind of like, no, I, and you really do see this. Like we can really say that I actually do live this life where it's like when shit happens to me, I don't get angry and go out after people. I want to show more appreciation to the people who appreciate me Good and things like that. So I do appreciate you. <laughs> it's so hard to find studies that I have heard of studies that say controlling your, uh, controlling your anger adds empathy but I can't really find them anymore, but you can find well, studies all over the place that say having anger <laughs> issues leads to increase a uh, decrease of empathy. Is it the chicken or the egg though? Does, well, the does learning how to control your anger, does learning how to control your anger lead to you having greater empathy or yeah. does you having empathy teaches you how to control your anger better? I don't know if why maybe one affects the other, but it might be secular. It might be a chicken or the egg There's thing. It might not be like people. If you already have that empathy, then you're probably already going to have that control. You might have an easier job controlling your anger and yeah, managing so, it. Yeah. But yet if you don't have it that, it might not be linear. Yeah. It might be both are actually true. Most likely. And the only other caveat that I want to toss into our conversations is correlation does not always mean causation. No. If one thing affects another thing, it doesn't mean that it causes that thing. Yeah. But there could be, so we together in these conversations and you on your own are looking at the correlations between trauma and empathy and a creativity and imagination and how that leads people into lives of helping others or helping animals or having a greater appreciation or understanding for the animals that they keep. Yeah. Uh, something I wanted to ask you, since you're always so busy, you think you could put aside 20 minutes to 30 minutes a month or every other month yeah. And we could do a live talk on a Thursday night or something and invite so people can come actually ask us questions. Yeah. And talk on talk on one subject. Okay. For 20 to 30 minutes. I think that'd be cool. Yeah. I'll text you about that. I think that would that. lower the amount of time that you got to spend on it. And then we get more people involved. It'd be really cool to have other people chime in with their experiences. Yeah. And these, <laughs> these topics are so deep that I don't usually are. want to go to live, but if it's you and me, then I don't have as big a problem with it since we, we do have a better understanding than the other. I think that would be cool, man. Yeah. I, think I like I that idea. We, I don't have to... Somebody the other day tried to get on to me on uh, freaking Instagram when I showed video of my bearded dragon swimming with me and he was just enjoying himself, just loving it. And he would literally swim back to me. He's always done that. Pitch is the only one that'll swim away from me. She just, she's so bitch the bitch. She's so independent. And that guy Rhodes, he goes freaking look up the, the term anthropomorphizing scientist. And he goes, the reason why that dragon's reacting that way is because of the chlorine. I'm I wrote him back. There's no chlorine. I I always keep the whole idea and notion of anthropomorphizing in the back of my head. Cause I think we do it a lot. I think people do it a lot, 
but I don't think it's a bad thing because I don't think, I think if you're over overly anthropomorphizing your animals, I don't think it's leading you to be less compassionate with them. I think it's leading you to be more, you're offering them more enrichment opportunities and you're offering them more. As long as you're not like, I get nervous. And I think we've talked about this before. Like, I, I, I get nervous when people like bring their snakes to like home Depot, like Which you're going to hurt your animal. You, you don't want to endanger your animal. You don't want to create a public scene yeah. of people who are afraid. Like, you know, you don't have to, you know, bringing your animals into scenarios where it's a planned educational event, like a uh, event, like a reptile show or like a herb society meeting, but don't bring your snake to Walmart with you. But, um, I, I, aside from that, I, I think, you know, if we are anthropomorphizing too much, I, I think there's more positives than negatives from that. Why don't we make this the first topic? Anthropomorphizing. anthropomorphizing? Yeah. We just make it the okay. first topic for the, you know, 10, 20, uh, 20 to 30 minutes. Yeah. I can text you about that, man. Yeah. And then you've seen these before. Haven't I ever showed you any? Yes, you have. Whoa. What have I done? Yes. <laughs> Uh, I will, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll talk to you about, uh, the time I met the, uh, president for the, uh, air patrol for the, uh, because I walked my dragons, but I met the, uh, air patrol, uh, president of, uh, Shriners. Oh, wow. Okay. And so I want, I have a show I want to put on here in St. Louis for Shriners, a reptile show. And what I want to do, if, if you want to go, we can talk about this later. But if you want me to explain it real quick, these right here would be great to paint. Yeah. So let the kids paint them. So we have people like you. So this isn't an expo where you're selling stuff necessarily. But okay. we bring out people like you, a uh, guy from Lizard Brain Radio, things like that. Five, ten animals that you can talk about for, you know, 15 to 30 minutes a piece and have different booths where people can go to. And then you can spend that 15 to 30 minutes talking to them to where we have an hour to two hour show for people to actually walk through. I like that. And then what we do there is the kids that are in Shriners get to come down and get a Peter Banded version or a Bearded Dragon version or something that I have here. They get to paint them. And then when they hand this in, this will go to auction. Okay. And then they, they'll get a rubber version to take home. Okay. I love that idea. But then, <laughs> what if we invited somebody like Mahomes or Travis Kelsey, Mark uh, Ham, the guy from Mad Men? He's actually from St. Louis. John Ham. John Ham. John Ham. We invite him to come down and auction, like the the St. Louis Blues players or Cardinals players, auction off. A tour with them through the reptile, the, through the reptile thing. How many thousands of dollars do you think we could bring in for Shriners Children's Hospital? If you could get John Ham to do it, or his brother Mark Ham. Oh, any of them, freaking Mahomes! How many people would pay thousands to walk through a reptile tour with Mahomes? Oh my God, we could get. Dream Keep dreaming big, man. And I think it's doable. Like, I think that's actually doable. It just takes time. It does. I will text you. Look at this is a creepy lighting right now. Oh, no, I'm used to your face. I know. I'm, I can't get this lighting right, man. I need to get one of those weird ring light things that the Instagram yeah, that's what I do. have. I, um, I have to sign off, sir, but it was awesome talking to you tonight. Thanks for having me you back gotta, on again. You got to get me the earrings so that I can work a hot topic. What, you got to you gotta get the big holes. <laughs> I'll send you the earrings as soon as you get big holes. Hey. Thank you. For I'll text you this weekend, man. It was great talking to you, brother. I love you, man. You are love amazing. you too, brother. Thank you for coming on. 